uh, it has only one chapter. Uh, there are 25 verses. This book is just before Revelation. So let's turn to book of Jude and read one verse. We will read verse 11. Is it clear now? Am I audible? Yes, we hear you, Uncle. Okay, okay. Jude, verse 11. I'm reading it. Woe to them that have taken the way of Cain. They have rushed for profit into Balaam's error. They have been destroyed in Korah's rebellion. I am also reading verse 1 because that speaks about the author of this book. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James, to those who have been called, who are loved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ. May loving Heavenly Father bless the portion that we have read from the scriptures. Father, bless it for us, for our edification. In Lord Jesus Christ's precious name we pray. This book is uh, one of the smallest books in the Bible, but it's, it also has an interesting content. Uh, the primary interesting thing about this book is that it was written by the half-brother of Lord Jesus Christ, Jew, by name Jude. Jude physically uh, in, on this earth when Lord Jesus Christ was living on this earth in human form, he was related to him as the half-brother. But he did not introduce himself as the half-brother. Half he said, Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ, that uh, teaches us about humility. He could have referred to his relationship, his earthly relationship to Lord Jesus Christ, or with Lord Jesus Christ, but he didn't quote that. But after that, he, he had written or he expressed his relationship with James, the brother of Lord Jesus Christ, half-brother of Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, he wrote only a small epistle. It also, it's also called as book. It's also called as an epistle. And this epistle contains only 25 verses. The last two verses, I think, they're titled as doxology. And many pastors, they quote the benediction words from these two verses. And uh, the first verse and, the, and verse 24, they highlight the theme that God is the preserver. Uh, the first verse, second portion, it says, to those who have been called, who are loved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ. <coughs> they are kept for Lord Jesus Christ. That means kept for the second coming, are kept for eternity. And verse 24 also talks about the Lord's ability to keep us. To him who is able to, I'm reading verse 24, to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God our Savior, be glory, majesty, power and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. So it talks about preservance. Our Lord preserves us. But there is something that we also need to do uh, as our part. We need to be aware of the things that happen to us. We need to take caution. We need to take warnings from the Lord. And we need to pray for our preservation. We need to pray that the Lord preserve us holy, guiltless, uh, that we would be presented as the bride, you know, to Lord Jesus Christ by the Father. And um, so we need to look forward to that those coming days uh, when we either meet the Lord when he comes the second time or if we leave the world before the Lord comes the second time, you know, probably we will, then we will meet him and go into his presence. Okay, we read verse 11. It speaks about three important things. I think we will meditate on only one particular thing today. Go to them. Go to them. They have taken the way of Cain. They have rushed for profit into Balaam's error. They have been destroyed in Korah's rebellion. Here Jude quoted three persons. One is Cain. Second one is Balaam. The third one is Korah. 
Of course, along with Korah, there were others also. But three names are prominently mentioned here, Cain, Balaam, and Korah. What are the things that are mentioned along with their names? Number one, the way of Cain, the way that Cain had chosen, the way that Cain had followed, the way that Cain had pursued, the way that led him astray, that he, the, the way that uh, uh, brought a disastrous end, disastrous result in his life. That's about Cain, the way of Cain. Second one, the prophet of Balaam. Balaam was after a prophet and God repeatedly told him not to curse his children, Israelites, but actually Balaam cunningly and uh, he gave a suggestion to Moabites who seduced the Israelites so that they would incur the wrath of God. You know? So Balaam was after the prophet, but initially many times he rejected this earthly prophet. He was not after money. He gave, uh, okay, we are, we are not meditating on Balaam's character today. There are many things that we can learn from the meditation of Balaam's character. And third thing, they have been destroyed in Korah's rebellion. So the thing that is mentioned about Korah is that Korah rebelled against the leadership of Moses. Moses at that juncture humbled himself to the core. But Korah did not relent on his rebellious attitude. He rebelled. He could have corrected himself, but he didn't. So the, we will meditate on the first aspect, the way of Cain. Um, what is the way of Cain? What's the speciality about it? Actually, in the context, if, the, if we take the context in which Jude had written this epistle, and also the people that he mentioned who had the characteristics of Cain and Balaam and Korah, they were false teachers. They were like wolves in sheepskin. They were uh, uh, promoting immorality, but they had crept into the church. They were also part of their love feasts. They were attending the church. So he, um, Jude described them in various terms. Actually, those terms we can find from verse 12 onwards. Shepherds who feed only themselves, clouds without rain, blown by the wind, autumn trees without fruit and uprooted, twice dead. So many phrases he uses to describe them. But the point today, uh, the, the, the focus of our attention today is that even though we are believers, sometimes we may incur God's wrath by following the way of these people. So that's possible. So that's how we need to take the exhortation from these examples. There are certain people, they are actually not believers. They're also, they also attend the churches. They have gone astray, but they lead people astray. They are false teachers. They follow false doctrine. They don't accept God's sovereignty. They don't accept the deity of Lord Jesus Christ. They don't consider Lord Jesus Christ as God himself. And uh, there are many people who have fallen prey to these false teachings. You know? And not only that they have fallen prey to false teachings, but they also promote false teaching. And where are they? No, they are not having different churches. They may have different churches also, but sometimes they creep into the regular evangelical, Bible-believing, salvation-believing, born-again experience-believing churches. So they create problem. One of the main things that they do is that they promote sexual immorality and worship. Actually, there are lots of examples are given in this one chapter about such people. We need to really, really take caution about such people. Another problem that we are thinking about today is that sometimes we as children of God, as believers, born again believers, you know, we also fall prey to the temptations of Satan and we follow the ways of these people. There's a big danger and we need to take a big lesson from each of these characters. They have taken the way of Cain, woe to them. Go to such believers. God did not say to believers. Actually, about them, he used this word. And in Matthew chapter 25, I think, um, 
God used such word, woe to them, that was with reference to Pharisees, because they were also following a religion uh, where they did not have, uh, they were not really following the truth. You know? Now let's look at the character of Cain, what happened in his life. Why Jude had to mention Cain here in verse 11. Let's turn to Genesis chapter 4. That's where we get to know about the life of Cain. There are many things that we can learn about Cain. Maybe we will focus on five important aspects. Um, number one, uh, Abel and Cain, both of them brought the gift to the Lord. If we originally go to the Hebrew word, it talks about gift only. Um, I'm reading <clears throat> verse 3. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord, but Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. <coughs> Here, this is the first thing that we are learning. The first lesson. Uh, both of them brought gifts. <coughs> Cain brought something from the field, the produce of the field. And uh, Abel brought the fat, uh, something from the flock, sheep let's say, uh, from the flock, animal. Some interpreter, they say that because Cain brought an animal and offered it as a sacrifice, blood was spilled. That's why his offering was accepted. But many other interpreters say that whatever might be the gift, uh, for God to accept whether blood was spilled or not, that was, that's not the important criterion that God looked at, God had taken into consideration. <coughs> if we go through the verse, we will understand the difference between Abel's gift and then Cain's gift, or Abel's motive and Cain's motive. I'm reading verse 3 again. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. But Abel also brought an offering fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. There are two important elements that we see here. Abel brought fat portions. What is good? What is pleasing? Uh, what, what's the best, in other words? What's the best? He brought the fat portions. And in the case of Cain's gift, we don't find such description. He just brought some of the fruits. The second difference we find here is that he brought from the first bone of his flock, of his flock. Maybe uh, we are not very sure whether Cain brought the first produce, the first fruits. First fruits are uh, uh, of greater value. He just brought some of the fruits. What does it indicate to us about Cain and his attitude? Uh, if we read another verse from the Bible, which talks about Abel's sacrifice or Abel's offering or Abel's life, you know, we will get to know more about the attitude of Abel. That is there in Hebrews uh, uh, chapter 11, verse 4. I'm reading Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4. By faith, Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as righteous when God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith, Abel still speaks even though he is dead. Three times with reference to Cain, the word that is used here is faith. There was an element of faith in God when Abel brought his offering. But that was missing in Cain. He also brought an offering and he thought that he did a great job. He was not happy when his offering was not accepted. That's what happens to many who attend the church even today. They may be attending the church, they may be participating in different activities, church activities, youth meetings, picnics, fellowship gatherings, community meals, love feasts. 
but they may not have faith in them. Then what are they pursuing? They're pursuing empty religion. Religion without faith is empty. They have only a tradition. They are only un they are under assumptions. They assume that God was happy with them. But actually, it's not so. Their life is the life of Cain. They have chosen to follow the way of Cain. They have not believed Lord Jesus Christ. If anyone is there in our fellowship who has not put their trust in the Lord, who has not sought forgiveness from the Lord through his precious blood, who has not put their real trust in the Lord, you know, they need to take a lesson from the life of Cain and then give their heart to the Lord that their life would be abundantly blessed. Problems do come. They will come. It will not be a smooth sail. A spiritual journey is not a smooth sail. It's not a bed of roses. Problems will come. But God will give us the ability to face them. Temptations will come. But God will give us the ability to overcome them. So it's very, very important that instead of just following a ritualistic Christian religion, it's better we put our faith in the Lord and accept him into our fold, into our heart, receive him into our heart, that he will accept us into his fold. And we can call him truly, genuinely as Abba Father, and he will be happy to have us as his children. When this takes place in our heart, you know, there will be joy in heaven. When one sinner turns to the Lord in repentance, so there will be great joy in the presence of angels uh, in heaven. So that's what has to happen. But the other thing about it is that as believers also, sometimes we might follow the way of Cain. We might become just ritualistic. We accepted Christ as our personal Lord and God and Savior, but we might still be uh, over a period of time, probably we might have lost that interest, that zeal, that passion, that evangelistic, that evangelical passion to follow the Lord. We might have become very, very nominal. Some people used to call, uh, use this phrase, nominal believers. Are we like that? I have to examine myself. I have to take this challenge to me. I have to take this exhortation to myself and correct myself. Have I followed the way of Cain? Or am I following the way of Cain? Have I become very ritualistic? Not really enjoying God's word, not, not really taking the exhortation as it should, should have been taken. Not correcting myself, just doing the things in a routine. If we are in the routine, not exercising faith in the Lord, not taking matters with zeal and enthusiasm and passion, you know, probably this exhortation is for us believers. So he was following empty religion. There was no element of faith. In the case of Abel, three times it is mentioned in Abel, even after his death. By faith, Abel still speaks, even though he is dead. I think it's, it's fantastic. <laughs> and uh, God commended him as righteous. Because he exercised his faith on the Lord, on God. He brought a better offering because there was an element of faith. Cain did not bring such an offering like Abel did. Because there was no element of faith. He just brought it for bringing sin. I do not know what kind of instruction they, they had received from Adam and uh, Eve, their parents. Abel was the first child born into this world. First child to a couple. Yes, he had a great privilege, but he lost that privilege. So, first one was about his empty ritualistic religion without faith. <clears throat> That's what we need to think about and we need to examine our lives in the light of this. Number two, uh, uh, as part of this, also, I think one important thing we need to uh, brood over. We need to think about. Uh, I'm reading from verse 4. Later portion. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering. Lord looked with favor at two things. The offering as well as the person who offered it. If our heart is pure in God's sight, 
what we do will be pleasing. So they go hand in hand, what we do and what we are. They go hand in hand. That's why it's very, very important for us to examine our lives and keep us holy, keep us sanctified in God's sight. We are prone to uh, succumb to temptations, very much prone to. But the Lord's, there is power in the blood of Lord Jesus Christ. If we claim the forgiveness through Lord Jesus Christ's blood, you know, they are saved, they are forgiven. The restorative forgiveness is available. But if we don't do that, if we don't claim that forgiveness through Lord Jesus Christ, blood, you know, we may get accustomed to a kind of life and we might be inadvertently, unknowingly, unwittingly following the way of King. And we are in danger if we are doing that. Verse 5, <clears throat> similar thing, the uh, same concept is explicitly mentioned here. But on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. Not just with Cain and his offering also. His offering, it, it doesn't really matter how much money we give to God. It doesn't matter how much labor we labor in God's vineyard without having a heart to love the Lord and exercise faith in Him. We might be sacrificial even, but that doesn't matter. How are we in our inner being? That matters. If we are uh, upright in our inner being, I think uh, our thoughts also will be upright. <clears throat> uh, it's mentioned uh, very explicitly here in verse 6 also. If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? Will your offering be not accepted? First of all, will you not be accepted? You will be accepted. So that's the thing. The second important thing is that God told him beforehand and uh, uh, explained him his status. What did God tell him? Uh, but if you, I'm reading from the later portion of, uh, and I'm reading from the later portion of verse 7. But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. So God told him beforehand. Sin is at your doorstep. It's only one step between you and sin. Take care. Take the warning. Take heed the, the instruction. Take the caution. Had Cain taken the warning seriously, he would have changed his face. The pity is that he did not take the warning seriously. Many, many times through the exhortation messages on Sunday, on the other days also, God would bring caution, warning, and exhortation to us. If we ignore them, we are the losers. But if we take them uh, by their value, you know, if we give value to them, our base would be mended. <clears throat> we'll be on the right track. We will be on the right path. We'll be on Abel's path. So here, God gave a choice to him. God gave a warning. As he gave a warning, he gave a choice. Now sin is there at your doorstep. It's about to engulf you. It desires to have you. But you must rule over it. God told him that. Rule over it. Win over it. I'm there to help you. God would have, could have easily helped Cain if he had heeded God's warning and taken God's caution and warning seriously. But Cain did not take. God is bringing caution to us, warning to us today. How are we now spiritually? <clears throat> Sometimes we would be backslidden, but we could be comfortable in the backslidden stage because we love sin. We love immorality. It gives us momentary joy. And if we love it, you know, we are on Cain's path. So that's the trouble. It led him to destruction. May that not happen to us, any one of us. For that to happen, that for, for us to be saved, delivered from the ill consequences of our path, of our way, you know, we need to heed to God's instructions. We need to make a choice. That the world of God, Satan and sin on the other side, and that God and the purity on the other side. In our thoughts, in our imaginations, in our plans, in our dreams, in our aspirations, we might have gone astray. 
God wants us to come back to the um, right path. <clears throat> the second thing was that God very clearly indicated him to him about what was happening in his life, what was his status, and he had a choice to make, but he lost the choice. He did not choose the right thing. Number three, God actually raised certain questions to him. It's beautiful to know God to raise questions which make us think, which make us also answer him back. No, we need to tell him or give him our answers. There are many questions that God raised with Cain. Verse 6. Uh, why are you angry? God understood that he was angry. God could note his and notice his emotions. He was angry. Why is your face downcast? This was the second question. And uh, he should have prepared himself to answer those questions. He should have thought to himself, I am angry. Is it worth to be, ang to be angry? My motive was not correct. I did not bring my offering like Abel did. They were not fat portions. They were not the first to produce from the field. I just brought a little bit. My offering was not a wholehearted offering to the Lord. I should feel ashamed of it. He should have thought about it that way when God raised these questions. And God asked him some more provocative questions. Provocative in the sense which would make him to think. Verse 9. The Lord God said to Cain, Where is your brother Abel? I don't know, he replied. Am I my brother's keeper? The Lord said, What have you done? Two questions. Before we get into those two questions, we will also look at the previous ones. After God revealed that sin was uh, crouching at his door, he should have taken a pause, he should have taken time to think about his life, evaluate his life. Probably he was busy with various other things. He was busy with raising crops. He did not give heed to God's instruction. Many times our life also is so busy that we don't take time to sit quietly in God's presence to evaluate ourselves, in prospect ourselves. I think there is a great need for that. I know some people who have regular fasting times, fasting prayer days. It may not be a whole day sometimes. It may be a half day. But they would like to spend some amount of time in God's presence. I know a God servant, servant of God, who is a servant of God in an assembly. Every year, he takes about a week to 10 days as a sabbatical week or sabbatical 10 day period. He goes to some other place, other city, and he plans it well beforehand. He is um, alone with God. He has a great responsibility of taking care of the assembly, taking the prayer requests, listening to people's um, narrations and then understanding them and then counseling people, organizing events. But he takes time. He wants to spend time alone with God. He goes away from his wife, away from his children. He spends time. I think that's really good. When I was in the university, I first time heard this word, sabbatical leave. Professors used to be given three-month leave, paid leave. And they could do any small course or do any writing or any other profitable or useful work during that time. But just stuff it, they need to submit to the university. And they are given the privilege after working for a few, or a few years, after putting in a few years of service, no? they, get, they used to get that. It's a biblical concept. And here, he did, should have taken time to think about what God has said. But he didn't do that. What did he do? Was it? Now Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out to the field. While they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. And uh, <clears throat> this was the first murder. A murder that happened between two brothers in a one family. It's really unfathomable. How could he kill his brother? There was no precedence of anybody killing the other person. But he initiated it. Some interpreters say that he lured his brother to go into the field. Maybe he talked, spoke to him nicely. It says, Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out to the way. He had planned everything. Sometimes it nice believers also. We cause 
uh, damaged the reputation of other believers. And uh, sometimes we lure them into a situation and we do that. We spoil somebody's reputation. We do that. We found that this is a way of gain, you know. We do that. We need to take caution. We shouldn't do that. If anything is there, if any bad thing is there in the other brother, and uh, there are ways by which we could counsel them, we could bring the truth out, and uh, we could initiate a conversation. There are many things that are mentioned in the Bible. If we are genuine friends, you know, if we love somebody genuinely, if there is anything that is very much lacking, and if only if that is corrected, if that gets benefit to the other person, and there are ways that we could do, we could cause benefit to their friend, to the fellow believer, fellow brother. But here, actually, he attacked his brother, and not how he attacked him. He attacked him to the extent that he even killed him. And he shed blood. Blood was shed. That's why in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4, we read about blood. And the third thing is that when God asked this, those questions, and uh, he should have admitted his mistake, but he didn't admit. Rather, he followed his path. He pursued his own desires. Uh, these questions are here, verse 9. Where is your brother? He should have plainly told what had happened. Another chance came to him. God was uh, actually giving him another opportunity to confess his mistake, to come out with truth, and to set things right. But he didn't do that. Uh, he rather asked another question to God in his reply. I don't know, he said. That was a lie, he lied. He replied, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? The Lord asked another question. The Lord said, what have you done? He knew everything. He knew where Abel was. He knew what he, Cain had done. Actually, these are uh, questions that are reminiscent of the questions that the Lord God had asked Adam and his wife, Eve. Chapter 3, verse 9. Similar question he asked. Chapter 3, verse 9. I'm reading that. Uh, but the Lord God called the man, Where are you? Here, where is your brother? Does God not, uh, did God not know where Abel was? How his body was lying on the ground? He knew. And he asked his question purposely. Second question. Am I my brother's keeper? Oh, no, here. Where is your brother Abel? Second question, what have you done? And in uh, the same chapter, chapter 3, verse 13, God asked a similar question to Eve. What is this you have done? I think there is a repetition of questions. I am sure Adam and Eve also would have told Cain and Abel what had happened before they were born. They should have taken a lesson from that. Another opportunity God gave to him to come to senses, to his senses, to come to the reality, to admit mistakes. Sometimes we don't do that, and we are the losers. We lose our peace, we lose the benefits, the spiritual benefits, and many other blessings also. Fourthly, we will see um, what happened here. That uh, he answered that way and then he incurred the wrath of God. He incurred a curse. Verse 11. Now you are under a curse and driven from the ground which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. God is very clearly telling what had happened. What Cain did. You shed your brother's blood. And earth received it. When you work the ground it will no longer yield its crops for you. You will be Restless wanderer on the earth. Two things, two kinds of punishments. The labor that he labors would not fetch good results. Even though he would try to till the soil, raise crops, they would not yield as he expected them to yield or the soil to yield. And not only that, you would be a restless wanderer. 
In verse 16, it's mentioned again. So Cain went out from the Lord's presence and lived in the land of Nod. He stepped in. Nod means wandering. He wandered. How long did he go? He did not know what to do. His mind would have been confused. And he was a wanderer. Not just because he became a wanderer. He did not get fruit of his labor. He wasn't able to see much fruit. He would have toiled for his survival. So twofold punishment came upon him. Sometimes if we don't give, if we don't heed to God's instruction, warnings and cautions, you know, and don't put our faith in and correct ourselves, what we do also will not fetch good results. Sometimes it might appear to be fetching good results. Actually, we will not retain them. Second thing, we would be like wandering cane getting engaged in different activities, but not having peace inside. He was like that. And what, did Cain, what was Cain's response was 13. He said, my punishment is more than I can bear today. You are driving me from the land and I'll be hidden from your presence. I'll be a restless wanderer on the earth. Whoever finds me will kill me. It was just like a statement. It was not out of repentance. We don't find any symptom of repentance in Cain. He was unrepentant. He was ritualistic, religion, uh, following a religion, not having the element of faith. And uh, God had foretold before what was happening in his life. He rejected it. He ignored it. That's the second thing. And the third thing is that God gave opportunity to realize his mistake but he did not admit his sin. He did not admit. God knew what had happened. God knew the truth. And here, he incurred God's wrath when God pronounced curse on him you know, and his work. He should have turned to the Lord in repentance, but he was still unrepentant. He made a statement saying that, you are driving me from the land, and I'm going to be a wanderer, a restless wanderer. Anybody who finds me will kill me. Was there any element of repentance in that? No, no. He was only admitting what God had said, accepting it. Instead of accepting what God had said or what God had done in his life, you know, he should have come with repentance, come to God. Or gone to God. God was gracious to him. But the Lord said to him, verse 15, not so. Anyone who kills Cain will suffer vengeance seven times over. Then the Lord put a mark on Cain so that no one who found him would kill him. He provided safety for him. He put a mark on him. No, 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 nothing like that. If anybody kills you, they would incur sevenfold curse, sevenfold wrath. How safe Cain was. God put a protection around him. Wherever he went, people would not kill him because there is a mark that God had put on him. Could not have clear details as to how it was laid on him or what kind of mark God put. We do not know clearly. But definitely anybody would understand. And he would not be killed. What a lovely last opportunity he got. Then he should have said, Lord, even though I murdered my own brother, even though I shed blood, even though I lied to you, even though I rebelled against you, even though I did not answer you correctly, you you knew everything and you were so gracious. That's why you have given me this last opportunity. He should have seen that. But he didn't do that. And uh, it says verse 16. <clears throat> so Cain went out from the Lord's presence and lived in the land of Nod, east of Eden. He should have stayed in Eden. He should have stayed there. Lord, I want to be in your presence. He should have said. But he followed a path which was an unrepentant path. As children of God, are we also going through this kind of a stage in our life where we are unrepentant of our mistakes? Sometimes they may be grave mistakes. Sometimes we may be lodging immorality in our character, uh, in our, uh, maybe immorality in us. We may be indulging in something that doesn't please God. I think we need to come back to God. If only we repent. God would embrace us. God would forgive us. God would take us to greater heights of spirituality, greater echelons of spirituality. What a loving God we have. The God who gave another opportunity to Cain. 
for his protection? Why would he not care for us? Why would he not forgive us if only we come with repentance to him? May the Lord bless these thoughts for us that we will not follow the way of Cain, but rather follow the way of Abel and that our life may be pleasing to the Lord. May the Lord bless these thoughts for us.